In biology, there is nothing more fundamental or basic than the cell. A Turing machine is in a sense fundamental in computer science, but it is also different uh, than the role of the cell has in biology. It is, it is more like the meter in the international metric system. The meter is a basic, basic unit and it is fundamental in the practice of science and engineering. But it, there is also an arbitrary aspect to it. The length of, of a meter could have been smaller or larger as long as we agree on using it as a standard. So a, a Turing machine is in some way similar to the meter. So I'm going to explain in what way it is fundamental and in what way it is not. And both uh, results come actually directly from, from the original work of Alan Turing who gave the name to these machines. So the Turing machine idea came actually from a fundamental question in science asked by the famous uh, mathematician David Hilbert at the Sorbonne, where I actually studied myself, but more than a hundred years before. Uh, Hilbert was somehow certain that there should be a way to automatize mathematics in such a way that every possible formula could be proven to be either a true or false um, theorem in a theory. Uh, in other words, he was proposing, although no, not explicitly, to build some sort of machine that could basically produce all past and future theorems. In other words, he asked, what is the power of mechanical reasoning, either human or machine-like? Uh, it took some time to get some answers, but eventually they came by way of mathematicians Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing, among other contrib contributors that came later. Gödel's um, answer was in the negative, proving that uh, there is no, not such a way to derive all possible truths from a theory without getting into contradictions. Alan Turing also gave the same answer in the negative, but showing uh, that if one assumes that one can construct a machine of such a kind to prove all mathematical theorems, then one gets into a contradiction as, as we will see later. So very much in the sense of uh, Kurt Gödel. Uh, but in providing the negative answer to Gil Hilbert's uh, question, and unlike Gödel's answer, in Turing's there was a surprising secondary positive result that had the amazing result to start a whole new field of science and lay the foundations of what we know today as computer science. So the Turing machine model has been very successful among other things because um, it, it has a very simple mechanical description. One can think of a Turing machine of some sort of actual device consisting of a head reading and rewriting the contents of a tape and performing different operations that um, we call states. The head can move one side or, or the other according to some basic rules. Uh, but to better understand our work uh, and, and work with Turing machines, one has to deal with more formal details. So another way to describe a Turing machine is as a collection of five distinguished elements, uh, what is known as a five tuple, consisting of a finite set of states Q, including two special states that will denote an initial state or configuration of the machine when it starts, and one when it finishes or halts a set uh, sigma of symbols that are either written on the tape or the head can write these symbols on the tape. And a transition function um, that we call delta that indicates how the machine will behave depending on the symbols that it is reading from the tape at that moment and the current state of the Turing machine. So let's see how it works. Let's uh, denote by sigma star the set of all possible binary strings you know, strings like the one on your screen, a sequence of uh, zeros and ones. We will define a formal language L that uses the symbols in an alphabet sigma, in this case binary. Then L is simply a subset of sigma star. It's like um, the English language. On the one hand, you can have all possible words using all the letters in the English alphabet, but not all of these sequences are going to be English words, only a subset of them. So let's assume that the words that we want to recognize are all those that start with a one followed by a bunch of zeros and ending with a one again. Um, 
So for example, 0111 is not a word in our language L because it is not a word that starts with one followed by at least a zero as it is required. So we want to build a Turing machine that recognizes only words in our artificial language L. For that, we will use a notation that resembles something like a flow diagram that uh, takes care of all cases in a very visual fashion. We can immediately recognize a few elements of a Turing machine. We said that there were two distinguished states among all, the initial one, in this case A, and the final one, in this case the accept state. Here we also have another one that I call reject that denotes the state of the machine when the input word is not a word in our language L. Then there, is, there has to be a one on the tape for us to move to state B in this uh, diagram. If more zeros come in the tape, we remain in the same state, but keep moving to the right until there is a one and if nothing else um, comes after. That is an empty cell on the tape follow. Then we accept the word as part of the language held and halt the machine. In all other cases, if anything else comes different to a zero or one, then it goes to the reject state. And this is how we have written and constructed a Turing machine that recognizes the language L. Um, notice that this machine represented by this state diagram is completely deterministic. There are no loose ends of, of something that could come in the tape or other cases for which there is ambiguity. Every case is properly covered, and this is why this particular Turing machine is said to be deterministic. Um, also notice that we are using R and L for right or, or left, and that's, that this, this is basically reading a, a, a Turing machine tape. Um, now, it is also interesting to see that this state diagram is very similar to the state diagrams of other type of machines such as finite automata, if you, if you happen to, to, to have seen them before. But the key component in this diagram is that the, the rules have a head movement, precisely the R and the, the L that I talked about, as it is reading the contents of a tape. So it is a sort of memory. It is actually a memory, the tape. And this memory is what makes the Turing machine model so powerful. And indeed, it is a tape that makes all the difference um, when you compare it against other models of computation less powerful than the Turing machine. For example, if you limit the tape or limit the head movement or remove the tape altogether, it gives you machines of different power that build a hierarchy that is better known by the name Chomsky hierarchy. Yes, the same Noam Chomsky that is a political analyst, but also one of the most important linguists. Um, so, for example, um, even though a state diagram, diagram of a machine with no tape would look almost the same and can recognize our previous language, language L, only two machines can do certain things, such as recognizing these um, two languages on the bottom of your screen. Um, that are slightly more difficult than our languages, but not that much, actually. So this is uh, the content for a completely different uh, lecture that I might give uh, in the future. But I wanted to let you know that um, Turing machines are actually different to other kind of, of, of automata. And they are actually uh, more powerful than these other um, variations. So th let's do another example of a Turing machine, but using slightly different tools. This time, the idea is to recognize all the words that start with a number of zeros followed by the same number of ones and nothing else. Uh, so this word on the tape with four zeros and four ones will be an example of a word in our new, new artificial language L. Now, the strategy to accept this kind of words can be described in what it is called in modern computer science as a pseudocode. That is a code in mostly natural language that can be translated to any other specific computer language. The first pseudocode was actually written by Turing himself in his original Turing machine paper in 1936. Um, so the intuitive idea to construct a machine that accepts these words with the same number of zeros and ones is to replace the first zero with a marker, then move to the next one and mark it with another symbol. Then we repeat the process until no more zeros at the end. If for every new symbol for zero, 
there's another symbol matching every new marker for the zero. Then there's an, another matching for the one. Then the word is accepted. And if not, then it's rejected. We can see this in a more visual way. That is very useful to analyze the behavior of Turing machines. This is called a space-time diagram. So we start with the input word, in this case, the word with four zeros followed by four ones at the beginning. Uh, then by convention, the machine always start in state one or state A as in, pre in the previous example with a um, state diagram. Then as we said, we mark every zero with an X and every one with a Y. We repeat the process going back and forth um, until no more zeros remain. So you can imagine on, in your head, the head basically going back and forth, reading the tape and then finding a one, changing it to a Y, then coming back to look for the next first zero and change it to the, to the X. Um, and you can see how the history of the computation goes, which is the content of the Turing machine tape over time. At the end, the last um, row represents the output of the machine. And when they are all matched, we accept a word. And we can even use colors to see it more clearly. Um, so basically we accept a word when we find the same number of red cells uh, with, red, with blue cells. So this is how a Turing machine as a function can be visualized for a specific input. So let's also denote the head location by this small arrow on your screen. One can track down the behavior of, of the Turing machine over time for this rule. You see, the rule tells that if there is a blank and, uh, and the machine is in state one, then it leaves the blank and remains in the same state and moves to the left by using now uh, the minus one notation to the node left. So this machine basically enters into an infinite computation with no end and keeps moving the head to the left forever without changing any content, contents of the original tape. Now you can help me hack the code for this Turing machine by looking at this uh, and its, uh, at its behavior. If we assume that the number of positions of the head is the number of states, we can see that there are two states then because we have the arrow po pointing up and down and that's going to be the notation for different states. And with the, when the head is in state one uh, with the arrow, arrow pointing up and there is nothing on the tape, the machine um, leaves it uh, blank, moves to the right and changes to state two. Then on state two and a blank on the tape, it prints a blue square and moves to the right and keeps doing the same because it remains in state two. So we can now know what the mapping rule and source code for the Turing machine is. And here it is. I hope you got to the same result. The previous, previous Turing machines were quite simple, but not all of them are the same. This is an example of a much more sophisticated, even when it is it, it has only three symbols or colors in this case and two states. On your right, you have the behavior of this very simple Turing machine. And on your left, we have what is called a compressed version of the same space-time diagram, diagram that we were looking at before, only keeping the rows where the head went um, further to the right. Um, so it is another way to visualize um, Turing machines, but it is basically the same idea of a space-time diagram. And it actually looks like another model of computation that you may know or not, that is called a cellular automaton, but that is a topic of another lecture. Here, the idea is that even though Turing machines look very um, simple, they can perform um, complicated uh, and sophisticated computations. So this is a nice exercise for you. Um, I would encourage you to write a copy Turing machine such that given an, an input, the machine repeats the input after after the first part on the tape and halts. So basically it's going to make two copies of the same input. And that's, that's going to be a very interesting uh, exercise for you. 
That is because the best way to understand a subject is trying to make a program by yourself. 